third uh, our lecture. And uh, guys, please, I have asked you uh, last class to form your groups, right? Okay, so hopefully everybody has uh, the group. And, uh, okay. And uh, so next, next class, uh, please. That's it, guys. So next class, inshallah, we'll have our first group uh, sheet. Uh, and what you're supposed to do with your groups, and I'll give you more details about it. It will contain uh, exercises uh, similar to the ones that I gave up there, and it will contain also other exercises which are taken from old exams. I think I mentioned many times uh, before that this is very important, the group uh, worksheets are very important because uh, they will give you enough exercises uh, to practice for the quiz, because as soon as we finish that, then we'll have our first quiz, uh, so sometime next week uh, we'll have the first quiz which will be in the first uh, two or three topics uh, we've covered so far. I'll, um, once I finish today I have a few things to do and then once I finish I'm going to give you a summary of uh, what we've done so far and after that we're going to have a quiz. Remember, the midterm is not very far away from now uh, and I think in three weeks from uh, three or four weeks we'll have our midterm. So uh, remember, this is very uh, sort of intense course, uh, comprehensive, uh, very uh, uni you need to follow up. And the group sheet or the exercises that I'm going to give you will give you a very good uh, sort of overview uh, problems that if you do them, if you understand them, if you discuss them together, then inshallah you'll have a very good idea. Also, if you have any problems, then uh, we can discuss them. We'll have a video tutorial that dedicated to the group sheet, which I will uh, publish uh, in due time. All right. Uh, so let's get back uh, to what we were doing before, and I think we got to the point where we uh, discussed. Uh, we started by discussing the force, the electrostatic force between two, four, uh, two charges, and then we uh, we found that that was equal to uh, uh, this, uh, which is Coulomb's law. And then uh, after that, we extended this to go to uh, electric field. And we said that the electric field is simply e defined uh, by definition. The electric field is defined as uh, if divided by some test charge uh, to naught. And then from there, we talked about the concept. Uh, also, we found that the electric field for one uh, for point charge was equal to uh, Q R square, uh, where Q is the point, the point charge uh, of interest, and uh, the distance between that point charge and my point P, that's all. Okay, again, there is a, a vector, uh, electric field is a vector. And then immediately after that, and that's where I spent most of the class last time, we talked about the concept of uniform, uh, uniform electric field. That's where I spent uh, quite a bit of time last time discussing the uh, what's meant by uniform electric field and then from there we talked about the motion of a charge within a uniform electric field and we described that very well. We went back to uh, revisit some of the formula we discussed in physics 1 and then we used them to describe the motion because we, if it is uniform field that means we end up with uniform acceleration and if you have uniform acceleration then you use your kinematics equations and uh, problem is very simplified, especially if it is in one dimension. But we also looked at two dimensions, which is the time motion. All right? So uh, what I'm going to be doing today, inshallah, the first thing is to again follow up on the concept of the uh, uniform electric field. But what I wanted to do now uh, is something that is very uh, famous uh, or very common uh, in physics, uh, in electrostatics. Okay, so... Uh, um, this is uniform electric field. I think we mentioned that before. Uniform electric field, that means we have parallel electric field lines, right? They are parallel and they are equally spaced. That's how we depict or how we show a uniform electric field. The question we have or we're going to ask today is what if I place inside this electric field a dipole? And I'll tell you what a dipole is in a minute. What uh, a dipole is in a minute. So we just sort of. Uh, an electric dipole. So this is E dipole placed uh, in a uniform electric field. Okay. 
Okay, so I want to place uh, an electric dipole in a uniform electric field. I think I mentioned before the word di means two, two. two right? Yeah. So this is basically uh, what we're saying here. You place uh, two charges which have equal magnitude, but opposite. they are opposite directions. So this would be Q. Uh, let me take the uh, positive, uh, negative here and the positive here, <coughs> for a simple reason that you see in a minute. Okay, so this is my uh, positive Q and this is my negative Q and they're separated by some distance. You want to call it D fine, you know, some people call it D, some people call it L, but the distance between these two charges is uh, known. Okay, and they're fixed in such a way that the, uh, this line connecting the two charges is not, does not play any role in the motion if these guys move or on the electric field. Okay, so let's call the dipole. So a dipole, an electric dipole, is nothing more than two charges of equal magnitude and somehow they're connected. If you think of bonds, it's, they're connected with some, uh, somehow they're connected so that they, when they move, they move together. Okay, they're coupled. They, that's what the uh, physics term for that is. Now, uh, so I take these charges and I place them in a uniform electric field. What is the first thing that's going to happen? Take each charge by itself, isolate the charges. And what is the first thing that you're going to say this charge will be affected by the field in such way and this charge will be affected by the field in one uh, another way? Yes? The positive charge will move along the line. Move? Along the electrical the Move? Field. Just before we talk about motion, let's just go back, back up a little bit. Huh? Get louder. Release? Release? Accelerate. Accelerate. No what is going to happen to this charge? Let's look at this charge by itself. It's placed in a uniform electric field. What is going to happen to it? What is going to feel? What is it going to feel? It's going to feel a force, right? An electrostatic force that is defined as Q multiplied by E. And because the charge is positive, then the force will be along the field. Along the field. Right? Yeah. I gave you a good hint. You should tell me what's going to happen to this one. What is it? Tell me. Tell me what's going to happen to it. There will be a force, right? In this direction here, this force, right? So there is another force, F, I call that F, let me call it F positive. And I'm going to call this F negative. And I wanted to uh, just make sure that if somebody sees this. Uh, uh, so this is a F negative, and again, F negative is equal to a QE, the magnitude. If I look at the magnitude, is equal to F. Mm -hmm. So placing a dipole in a uniform electric field, what is the effect of that? There will be a force exerted on each of the charges. However, if you look at this dipole altogether, you see that there is a force acting on this direction and there is an equal but opposite in its, in its direction, in, in the opposite direction on the negative charge. Now, if somebody said earlier the, the dipole will move, you think the dipole will move? Yeah. It won't move because of the opposite. No, the two charges will move. No. It won't move. Think, guys, think, 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 think. Before you answer, I always say that. Before you just give me an answer, think of, uh, think of your answer. Go ahead. Now, what's the, how do objects move, or when do objects move? When, there's a force when, force when the sum of the forces is not equal to zero. But what's the sum of the forces? Take this as one object, just so, that, just so for the sake of argument. Take this as one object, and you have this force is pulling it this way, and this force is pulling it this way. We hit, move. Let me let me just let me just. Uh, I want to use the board, so I'm going to add one and go like this. So that I use the uh, remainder of the board. Yeah, I have my book here so that I don't go beyond the uh, screen. Okay, now remember uh, there are two types of motion. I don't know if you've covered this or not. There is something called translational motion. Translational motion. Okay? And then there is another type, Rotation. which is rotational. Rotational. rotational motion. The dipole is going to rotate. It will spin in its place. Translate means what? Translate means what? This, this is translation. From one place to another. Right? Yeah, from one place to another. 
translation. Will this dipole translate? No. 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 Why not? Because of the, the sum of the, the forces. Is is zero. Zero. Very simple. So here, this dipole, we do not, we should not expect it to move to translate from this position to this position but it will or from this position to this position. But what do you expect it to do? If we anchor it, if we anchor it here somewhere in the middle, you know what anchor means? Fix it. Yeah, fix it. Right? If I anchor it here at some point around some point O, right, O for origin or center or whatever you want, right? If I anchor it here and I apply these two forces on it, what is it going to do? Rotate. Right? Yeah. Right? Now, the only thing that you have to be careful with is that these two forces are the same. Right? If, they are, if these two forces are the same, then there is another issue that we have to talk about uh, called rotation equilibrium, if you've taken that in, uh, in physics one. Anyway, so now instead of, uh, if I anchor this, instead of this, I, instead of translation, what was not going to happen? I expect it to rotate. I expect it to rotate. How do we describe rotation or motion? How do we describe rotation one? What, what is the... It has acceleration to the center. How do we describe rotation and motion? Something called torque? Torque? As in? Right? You guys remember what torque is? As okay, torque, it's, it's written as this, is defined as the force F cross R. Okay, the force F cross R. It's not force. It's rotation. That, that's what describes motion. So if you have a torque that is not equal to zero, that means the, uh, the object will move. I uh, will rotate, sorry. Okay? So, and you know what the cross product is defined as? This is called, uh, this is defined as, if I want, you know, the magnitude of tau, the torque, is fr sine the angle theta. And theta in this case, theta is the angle between the ah, Yes, between the angle between between r and f. Between these two guys. So basically, if this is my r, R is the uh, distance or the moment, they call it the moment R. Okay, if this is R, then my angle theta will be somewhere, this is my angle theta, and this will be my angle theta. Okay, between the A F and R. Okay. Now the question is, when is this torque equal to zero? That's always the, in physics, we always like to do these things. You look at what, when is max, it's maximum, when it's equal to zero. And it's, so when is the torque equal to zero? When theta is equal to 90, 90, 90 degrees, because sine 90, uh, sorry, uh, when theta is equal to zero. So sine zero is equal to zero. So when theta is equal to zero, there will be no, yeah, no torque, and there will be no rotation. Can you explain that to me and say, if, let's say this is my dad, okay? And I wanted to apply a force that is equal where, where the angle between F and R is equal to zero. That means it's this force. Remember, this is R, and F is the push or a pull, right? Then if, this, if the force is this way and R is this way, then if I pull or push, it's well, not rotation, rotation yeah. right? If I come in here and I start either pulling or pushing, it's not really rotation. It's not going to cause it to rotate. The only way that it's going to rotate if the angle of theta is non-zero. And the maximum possible torque, torque maximum, when, that, when is that going to happen? When theta is 90. is 90. That means it's equal to F times R. Sine theta is equal to 1, and that's the maximum possible torque. So if you want to rotate something, if you want to get the maximum torque, then all you have to do is apply the force perpendicular to the uh, the arm, arm is the the uh, the uh, well uh, the, whatever is connecting the two charges in this case. So if you wanted to get maximum torque, then you apply the, for the force at 90 degree angle. Okay. So anyway, so the effect here, you say that if you apply a force and the uh, uh, dipole is anchored, then it's going to rotate. Now the question is, again, we still have a problem here because, uh, let me just, uh, I'll write it here. 
So now this way I'm going to call it the, tor the positive torque, torque positive, that means the F, uh, this force here is equal to F which is equal to QE and then the distance here if you want to call it D over 2 because if this distance is D here, that's, this will be D over 2. D over 2 and the uh, angle is theta so that's sine sine the angle theta but wait there is a negative torque right there is a negative torque t negative i'm talking about magnitude here the direction i'll tell you how to get the direction in a minute though. again it's equal to q e d over 2 sine the angle theta again that's still the angle theta there. now it's just like with forces have you taken torque before no. Yes. Yes. Never. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, torque is the, you use it just like when you use force to describe translation, translation and mo motion. You use torque to describe rotation and motion. Okay. So that means what? That means when I have a torque that is not equal to zero, my system will be rotating. And the same argument when you have the sum of the forces for a moving object. If the sum of the forces is equal to zero, that means the, for the object is said to be at equilibrium, except it's dynamic equilibrium. You know Newton's, uh, Newton's first law, an object moving with a constant speed continues to move with a constant speed unless you change it. You add. So, same thing here, if I have two forces which are the same angle, the same magnitude, everything, and they are rotating the object, they will be continuously rotating at some uh, constant angular speed we say that the object is at rotational equilibrium. Just like static equi uh, dynamic equilibrium, for translational motion, we say the object is at rotational equilibrium. Because rotational yeah. equilibrium, just give me one second, and then I'll come back to you with your question. So rotational equilibrium, that means I have to do the sum of the torques, which is torque plus, plus torque negative. OK, so the plus, the torque due to the uh, positive force of this force, and plus the torque due to the negative, the force on the negative charge. Remember, this is negative, that's positive. Okay? So that's what, how I do the sum of the torques. And because it is, these guys are equal, I expect this to continue, continuously rotate in some uh, rotational equilibrium position where the uh, speed, the angular speed is, uh, is constant. Okay? So, uh, have, uh, so this is the, uh, now if I add these two guys, then I get, uh, now, oh, before I go there, how do we get the sign of uh, the torque? Because torque is a vector. As the sign of that the means I have to. No. How do we get? How do I get the sign of the torque? Rotation. The uh, right, right, the yeah, the right hand rule. Okay. But for us, we will make it simple because we're doing it in two dimension. Yeah, we will make it simple. We will just say that if the rotation is clockwise then the torque will consider it to be negative. negative. If it is counterclockwise, we'll positive. consider it to be positive. positive. So we'll just say like this, if it's clockwise, then it's negative. If it is counterclockwise, it's positive, just to simplify things. So uh, remember, this is if this is theta, that's theta. So these guys, one of them is positive, and remember the other one negative, negative plus, so they, they are equal. And then I have, uh, in this case here, the sum will be two, I have to add these to T2 QED sine the angle theta. So that's the sum of the torques will be equal to that. Okay? So the torque or the net torque, T over two. Uh, the net torque, T net, is equal to, uh, what is it? Uh, that's, the two is gone, right? Because two, and that will take that guy over. Right? So this will be equal to QE, right? D sine the angle of theta. Okay? If I call this Q, and in fact the book does, this QE, uh, QD, sorry, QD, I'm going to call it something called the dipole moment. Okay? I'm going to call it the dipole moment. Then I can write the torque. So then I'm going to call my torque as equal to P ah, cross. E. You know how I get that? If these two guys here is P, P E sine theta is simply P cross E. I just work in the definition backwards. Okay? So that's my that's the torque. If you if you place a dipole, let's let's put it in words and you can write that down. 
if you place a dipole in a uniform electric field, then it will experience a torque that is equal to or defined by P cross E. And P is simply Q times D. Remember, P is the distance between these two guys, and Q is the charge. Okay? Very simple. Very simple. Okay? So, question? Can I repeat again? Okay. If you place a charge, if you place a dipole, not a charge, sorry. If you place a dipole in a uniform electric field, if you place a dipole in a uniform electric field, it will experience a torque, or a net torque if you want, that is defined by this formula. Okay? Torque is equal to P cross E. P is the moment. Uh, the dipole, uh, P here is called the dipole, dipole moment. It's just a definition to simplify it. The dipole moment. Okay? Now from here, from here, I can say uh, when is the torque maximum, when is the torque uh, minimum, and all that. When it's equal to zero, in fact. Okay. What is the uh, uh, torque maximum? 90 degrees. PE sine theta, it's right this way, so when this is 90, then I get maximum torque. So T ma uh, tau maximum is equal to P E and theta is equal to 90 degrees. What is that saying? That means saying that the dipole is perpendicular to the electric field. So that when the dipole is perpendicular to the electric field, that means you get the, the maximum. And that's, uh, that's understandable. It's usually shh, it's going to retreat uh, fast. However, if it is lined with the field, if the dipole is lined with the field, that means theta is equal to zero. Will it rotate? No. no. Okay? So if it is lined with the field, then you get the net torque is equal to zero. Okay? Because PE uh, sine zero is equal to zero. All right? Is that clear what the torque is about? Yes. Doctor, can you repeat the last yeah. part? The maximum minimum? Yeah. Okay. So if I define this, if I define this PE, PE sine theta, which is by definition, right? Then if theta is equal to 90, that means uh, the uh, dipole is perpendicular to the field, right? Yeah. Then it will experience the maximum torque, okay? okay? Because that's what it is, that sine theta is equal to 1. Because remember, sine is a function that goes from minus 1 to positive 1, okay? Now, if it is lined with the field, so if it is, uh, if, it, if the dipole is this way, so my theta is equal to zero, that means the torque would be equal to zero, and then there would be no rotation. Okay? Yeah. So it will be half rotation. Uh, half, not half. That's what you have to worry about. Who's, what's going to stop? That's the question to that. What is going to stop? It will right? stop like that. Not really, no. Because remember what we said, what we talked about uh, continuously at uh, Newton's third law? Uh, first law. If an object moves at a constant speed, it will continue to move at a constant speed and until something starts. Or something you will do something to change. Okay? So, uh, another question? Okay? Alright, so one more thing we want to do before we uh, move on. We wanted to look at the potential energy. Because remember, every motion is associated with potential energy. Okay. So, uh, guys, definition, again, this should have been covered in physics one. I don't know if it was or was not. The potential energy is defined as for rotational system is tau d here. Okay? If I place the definition for the torque, it will be from some angle theta initial to some angle theta final. Uh, uh, what, did, what did you say? You say P, P, E, cosine theta, that's the torque, and then I uh, integrate with respect to theta. This cosine or sine? Sorry, sine, sine, I'm sorry. Sine, thank you very much. Okay, sine theta. Guys, please. Okay, now I know P is constant, right? Yeah. P is equal to Q times D. That's constant. So I can take it out. And E is uniform. I can take it out of the integral. So what I have is simply P E sine 
theta d theta, which is what's the uh, integration minus of sine uh, cosine minus, minus cosine. cosine. So this will be minus p e cosine the angle theta, and I have to look at my limits theta initial to theta final. That will be my potential energy. This is for a dipole placed in a uniform electric field. Electric field. Electrostatic field. Okay? So that's what the uh, potential energy. Now we can definitely. Uh, uh, so the question, uh, all of these questions are very simple in the exams and the quizzes of work. So if I say if uh, a dipole initially was at, um, let's say, six, let's, let's do, do an example. So uh, this is just example. Okay, so, so for a dipole, I'm assuming that everybody say, knows that it's an electric dipole. Because uh, for an electric dipole, initially at theta is equal to 30 degrees with E. Okay? So that's my initial uh, theta. I can ask you to, uh, let's say, calculate calculate the uh, potential energy energy after four rotations, or actually after half rotation. After half rotation. Not complete rotation, but half rotation. Ah, uh, quickly, can somebody tell me very quickly how to do it? Yeah, go ahead. Well, we already know the... Start with the definition. Mm -hmm. Start with the definition. The def yeah, okay, start with the definition. Yeah. Minus P Let's, minus yeah, I have to go back here, right? Or we can come back. Okay, so minus P, E, <laughs> cosine, <laughs> theta, <laughs> final so minus theta final. initial, right? <laughs> so theta final minus cosine theta initial. I'm assuming that I gave you P, which is Q and D, right? You can get T the moment, the diagonal moment, you can get it simply from, if I give you the char, and I give you the distance between them, you can get that. And the electric field, of course, if I can give it to you, or I can tell you how to calculate it. So in this case, my initial angle is 30, right? If you want to draw that, that's simply something like this, right? So this is my uh, moment, or D, and this is my electric field. So the angle here is equal to 30. Uh, 30, sorry, 30 degrees. Now, half rotation. It's going to be 180 degrees. Uh, no. Plus yeah, 180. Yeah, it's going to be 30, 30 plus 180. Yeah, plus 80. Right? 30, plus remember, half rotation. Okay. 210. So, theta final will be equal to? 210. 210? 10. Okay, so theta final will be 210 measured from here. And then, as I said, if I give you this, if I give you that, you can uh, calculate the, the potential energy very easily. Okay? All right? It's very easy stuff. You just need to um, follow it and understand the concept. If you understand the concept, it's very easy. Don't forget, because that's always uh, an MCQ question or questions. Uh, the maximum and the minimum, that's something you always keep. Maximum is when the actual U is maximum. U is maximum, you have to look at PE ah, cosine theta. Okay? So what's the maximum potential energy here? When is theta maximum? Or when is this maximum? At zero. Theta is equal to zero. That has theta is equal to zero. Okay? Different than the torque, guys. Different than the torque because there you're dealing with the sine, and here you're dealing with the cosine. So if somebody asks you for the cosine, the maximum torque is not the same as the maximum uh, potential energy. Yes. Uh, um, the light is ruining. Like, okay. It's, nothing uh, is showing. Which one? The light from the projector. Ah, and the. Uh, okay. Nothing. I guess we have to. I'll come back to this in a minute. Actually, what we can do next. Uh, so this will conclude, guys. Uh, guys, peace, peace. This will conclude.
our first chapter all together. Okay. So the first chapter on uh, electrostatic force, uh, conservation of charge, uh, electric field, uh, motion of electric field, in, uh, sorry, motion of a charge in a uniform electric field, and today the electric blood. So let us run a summary. I want you to do the summary. So I want you to help me out so that we have uh, our summary of the chapter. And then inshallah I will move to the next chapter and uh, carry on. Yeah. So uh, let's just have... Okay, what's the first thing we talked about? Come on guys. I want you, yeah, take, take your notes and go back and start, we're going to start from the beginning and tell me, uh, so this is the end of uh, the first uh, two PowerPoint uh, lectures. Uh, so the first thing we talked about, we talked about the electrostatic force, which we define as, yeah, okay. So the electrostatic force between two charges, if I have charge 1 and charge 2, so this is Q1, this is Q2, and the distance between them is known, I don't know, we call it R12, then that's the uh, force between them, defined by Coulomb's law. Remember, this is the second fundamental force in nature. First one is gravitational attraction, and this is the second fundamental or part of the second fundamental force which the electromagnetic force and this is the electrostatic when the charges are fixed when the charges are fixed in space this is what the force between them is equal to now this is only two charges what if we have a lot of charges then we go to yeah so what we do we do the sum of the forces let's let's just take the same one the simple case where i have three charges okay so i have one Two, three, regardless of what the distance between them, regardless of what the size is, regardless of all of that. Business. So then the net force, the net force on one, on charge one, what will it be? It will be F three on one plus F two on one. This is called the super position. Okay, so the super position or the just sum up the force, the resultant force. Okay. Remember, this is only on this one, on this charge. If I want to do the net force on this charge, that should be the same thing. The same thing, I have to do the, uh, the uh, rule again, apply the rule again. And another fact we mentioned that if you measure the force, this is between 1 and 2. If I want to measure the force between F2 and 1, then it's simply equal to? Right? It will be the same magnitude, except in the other direction. F12 is equal to negative F1, uh, F1, uh, 2, 1, okay? So that's the first part. That's the first, I think, lecture or so. And then after that, we move to the concept of uh, electric field. What did we say about electric field? We said that if you have a charge or a group of charges, right, then there exists the vicinity surrounding these charges, there exists a vicinity in which the electric field here is not equal to zero, while the electric field outside this vicinity is equal to zero. What is, it? what is the definition of that electric field? What was the definition of the electric field? E was defined as simply the force per unit charge. And we selected a unit charge, which is the smallest charge we know of. It's very small and it has to be positive, and from there we calculated the force per unit charge in all of these. If I step outside that vicinity, then the electric field is one way. And for a single, for a, for a point charge, the electric field is equal to zero when, when R goes to infinity. Right, the electric field is equal to zero when R is equal to uh, infinity. Now, there are some points here which we discussed, and they are important. One of them is the point of zero force. Remember, we calculated the point where if you have a group of charges, or two charges, actually we took two charges, there exists a point between them in which the force is equal to zero. 
Okay? So that's something that we've calculated. We call it, we call it the uh, zero uh, force or the point zero force uh, uh, or the point where the force is equal to zero. Okay? And then from here we extended, uh, we did something else which we're going to pick up on today. The electric field due to a point charge was equal to uh, was defined as Q over R squared, and simply this is my Q, right? This is my Q and this is my point T. So the distance between these two guys here is my R. Okay? So this is the electric field at point T. At point T, remember the way I do that by placing a test chart in that point T, and then from there that test chart is very small. So if you look at the force here, QQ, right? So because it's very small, it does not have an effect. Okay? Unit, actually, in fact, it's a, a very small, up to one unit of whatever charge that you use. We can put K, right? I forgot to put K. This is K. Yeah, I mean, we can put just K instead of 1 over 4. Yeah, you can definitely, yeah, you can definitely put this as K. Right? Yeah? Okay? All right? So uh, I forgot to put this also a vector. Right? And then after that, once we grasp the concept of the electric field, then we moved on to defining what's the meant by uniform electric field, right? And we said we can establish that using something called the parallel plate capacitor. That's the easiest uh, device by which I can get the uniform electric field between the two plates. If I step outside the plates, I get zero. If I step inside the plates, I get uniform electric field. Okay, and if I have a uniform electric field, let me uh, write that here. So if I have a uniform electric field between these two plates, so E is uniform, this is my positive, this is my ne uh, negative, and I have a uniform electric field which has uh, a value here, the electric field was equal to Q over epsilon A, right? And uh, I know it's uniform. Then once it's once I know it's uniform, which is if especially if I'm away from the edges, then what happens? F will be equal to Q E. So that means if I place a charge here, the force on this charge will be equal to Q times E. So this is a force, uh, some charge Q. And from there, I can describe the motion of this charge inside. The electric, the uniform electrostatic. Sorry, this right? Can somebody tell me how would you describe Using the motion? Using kinematic equations. Ah. Using kinematic equations. If it would be constant, then uh, uh, it would be a, 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 a you acceleration. Can you would be uniform. Then Excellent. You can uh, use the kinematic. Uh, yeah, kinematic equations. equations. Yeah. That's very important. You will definitely see a question about this, maybe more than a question about this, is that when you place a, a charge inside a uniform field, what happens to it? Well, if it is a uniform field, then it will experience a constant force. Constant force will give me uniform acceleration. Uniform acceleration allows me to use kinematics equations which we discovered or we talked about in physics one. Okay? All right. So that's, that's what we did last time. And today, we concluded our discussion by talking about something called the Electric dipole. 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 Can somebody refresh? Tell me what did we talk about the electric dipole? What's an electric dipole? What's an electric dipole? Okay. okay. Uh, they are equal and uh, uh, opposite uh, direction. Uh, they're separated by some distance d yeah. and they're fixed in such a way. And they they have a rotation and motion. If we fix it, and if you place them in. A uniform electric field, then what happens to them? They have rotation. They rotate. Okay? Why do they rotate? Because of the fact that they have two forces. It's just like they call them, by the way, they call them the couple, the force, uh, couple of forces. Uh, one of them is this way, one of them is this way, and then they will rotate. Right? Yeah. Alright? And we did uh, not quantify, but we described the rotation and motion using torque. Okay? And then after that, we yeah, after we described uh, torque, we found the potential energy, which we found that it's a function of cosine theta, the angle between the, two, uh, the f, uh, sorry, the force and d. All right, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Say again. Potential energy. 
What is it called? Massive. Ah, what is it mass? Can somebody answer the question? That's equal to zero. 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 The potential energy U, which was a function of which was a function of cosine theta, right? Yeah. Yes. What is it maximum? That is equal when to zero. When cosine theta is maximum, cosine theta is maximum zero. one. When does that happen? That is equal to zero. The trig functions, cosine and sine, are very, very powerful. Yes? When does the diaphragm move in the rotation and motion? When you have the forces, when you place it in an electric field, you put it Because the electric field will apply a force on it. Yeah. We sort of eliminated that because uh, there is only one condition we're going to use. We said, okay, let's take the counterclockwise as negative. That's okay. That's why I had the rule. And if it is okay, this is as positive. Okay. So clockwise is negative. Counterclockwise is positive. That's the only situation that we're going to use. That. Sir, hmm? this is the motion of the um, dipole, uh, dipole, which is we're talking guys, about. Guys, guys, guys. Let's talk one at a time. Yeah. This is the rotation, whether it's positive or negative. We're describing the um, motion of the dipole? Yeah, it's rotation and motion of the dipole. Oh, okay. okay? And the direction of the dipole? It's with the feet. Okay? All right? No more questions? Yeah? So, I, uh, will the dipole keep moving or will it stop? When you place it in the electric field, it will apply a force on it and will continue to move because the forces are the same. Yeah. To rotate. Like Questions? Yeah. But like when the dipole is horizontal, the force like that is. If it is placed it horizontally, stop. no, don't no, no, stop. This is very. I think this is where the confusion is. Guys, please. If I place the dipole in such a way that it is parallel with the field, it will not rotate. Okay. If I place the dipole, if I turn on, that's easy to see. Huh? If I turn my electric field. So my dipole is this way, and I turn the electric field and it's this way, it's not going to rotate. But if I turn my, if my di dipole is this way, and I turn the electric field is this way, then what's going to rotate? Got it? It will not stop. It will, what is it going to stop? Because like when it's rotating, at a certain point it's horizontal. It's will, it will continue to rotate. Okay? Alright, guys, alright? Now there are more important uh, points here about the force, the electric field, the, uh, I forgot to mention the electric field lines and things like that. So the, the, all of these things are they are in here, and we said that the electric field lines are proportional to the magnitude of the field, the electric field, right? And so forth. Okay. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure if the dipole is parallel to the field, uh, to the uh, field, it will want to move. It will move. move. Yeah. But remember, I just think of it as turning it, turning it on off. Yeah. Okay. So I have my dipole. And I have my field, if it is this way, it's not going to rotate. Yeah. Or it's not going to rotate, I should say. If I place it in such a way that it's this with it, it will yeah. Okay? Um, if one of the charges has a greater magnitude, then there's going to be translation and rotation. It's not a dipole anymore. It's not a dipole anymore. It's not a dipole anymore. Die by two, and the condition it has to be equal. Okay, for now. Later, if you're, if you're an electrical engineer, and you go to apply the electric magnetism, then you talk about these things with the charge of the balance. Okay? You're not an electric engineer. No, I'm just going to do that. Okay. You are? We are here. Okay, good. Then you have to worry about that. Yes? Question? Ah, okay. All right. Anyway, so guys, I think it's a. Uh, but this is very important. This is the basics. Uh, honestly, this is the basic. What we covered in the last two lectures is the basics for everything that we're going to do in electrostatic. The remaining things that we're going to do in electrostatic are based on uh, these four, five, six concepts that we talked about. Very important to understand these things. Okay? I'm going to move on to the next part. Uh, shh, yes, please. I sort of introduced this before, but uh, okay, now we're moving to lecture three. If you're following me on the uh, on the PowerPoint slides, and as you can see, is it covering anything? You want me to? Yeah, just so that it covers everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, so as you can see here, the uh, this is lecture number three, and we're moving to something which is a little bit from our experience in the past. 
is one of the challenging uh, problems that uh, students face in physics too. And this is calculating the electric field due to uniform charge distribution. The electric field due to a uniform charge distribution. What's meant by uniform charge distribution? And what do we mean by this? Because if you understand it from the beginning, then the math and the calculus and everything will be probably uh, spare you on that a little bit. Yes. So, so far, we have been talking about point charges. So we look at the charges just like you looking at a very, very far away distance. That's what we have been doing. Now, what we wanted to look at, what we wanted to do, we wanted to see, okay, what if I have something like this, a line charge. So this is a positively charged line that is very long, meaning what? Meaning that the, this dimension is much bigger than the other two dimensions. So it's a line charge. This is called line charge. What I wanted to do, I wanted to calculate the electric field due to this line charge at some point P. So at some point P away from here, I wanted to calculate what the electric field is at this point. Okay? That's what I wanted to do. That's what we wanted to do. Not only a line charge, we also want to look at something like a sheet. Okay? So this is, a two, this is one dimension. This is two dimensions. So this is a sheet of some thickness. And I wanted to come somewhere close to the sheet at some point P. And I wanted to calculate this is P. And I wanted to calculate the electric field here. Okay, and uh, again for um, something like a sphere, something like um, uh, a ring, something, any, any, any charge that can be distributed over some volume. Okay. Now, uniform charge distribution means what? Means that the charge is equally distributed over the line in this case, or the sheet in this case, or the volume if I'm dealing with a, uh, a sphere. Okay, that's what mean, what's meant by uh, uniformly distributed charge. That means if I come in here and I take a chunk, small, very small chunk, and I come in here and I take this, the same dimensions for this small chunk, I'm going to get the same lambda, which lambda is the linear charge density. Okay, oh, sorry, the linear charge, yeah, the linear charge density. That means my Q will be equal to lambda times L, L being the length of the uh, line. Okay? So that means this lambda is simply Q over L. Are you confused yet? Yes. Yes? yes? <laughs> Good. Right. So what I have done, instead of looking at point charges, I am looking all over some big charge, Q. But this charge is distributed or divided into small point charges called lambda. So if I want the total charge, it will be simply lambda times L. So lambda, 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 lambda times L, I get the total charge. Where is the Q? Wait, this is, Q is the total charge. Q is the total charge. Q is my total charge. Okay. Now just, just let, me, let me do this again and, and you'll see that. So remember, I want the electric field here due to this uniformly charge distribution or uniform charge distribution. Now the way I want to do that by saying, okay, I know how to do it for a single or for a point charge. I, I know already how to do that. I, I say, okay, why don't I do it for this charge, for this which I know, and then not multiply. Uh, somebody good in math. Integrate. Ah, integrate over the whole thing. Right? Yeah. Integrate over the whole thing. So I calculate the. The, uh, the, dis uh, the contribution to the electric field due to this small, and we'll call it infinitely, infinitely small charge, and then uh, integrate over the whole thing. And that's where I usually say, warning, lots of calculus. So in this part, we have to do a lot of calculus. Where does the calculus come in? Every time we wanted to look at that, for example here, we we'll look at something called sigma, right? Sigma, just to distinguish, lambda is linear, linear charge distribution. Sigma is surface charge distribution, which is simply, if I multiply this, I get Q. My sigma is equal to Q divided by A. It's the charge per unit area. 
Here, the charge per unit length. So this is defined as charge per unit length. And this one charge, uh, what is this? Charge per unit area. And if I have a volume here, so Q will be equal to rho times V. So rho, which is the volume charge distribution, is equal to Q divided by V. V is the volume. And this will be my volume charge distribution. I, it's very important for me to know, uh, for you actually, to know how you know where everything fits. And then once we start the application, as I said, we'll help you a lot with the math. I'll do the math for you. Just we need to understand what the concept is understand it and then we we'll break it down. So what we want, we want to look at the electric field due to uniform charge distribution. So going from point charge to uniform charge distribution. So if I write this down here, right, I'm going to start Okay, so remember what E do to uh, E is equal to K. I'm just going to keep it as K now. K Q right divided by R squared, and then I have an R hat to give me the vector. Okay. Now instead of looking at it in terms of Q, I want to be. I will be looking at delta Q. Okay. So instead of looking at Q, which is a point charge. In here, it's a point charge, right? That's what Q is. And I come in here, and I calculate the electric field at point P. That's what we did in the past. Now, I'm going to, I'm, I will be looking at something which is DQ. But DQ is simply this guy here. So my electric field, it will not be E. It will be the electric field due to DQ is equal to K DQ divided by R squared. And I still have the alpha. So to find give me a second, give me a second. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Just give me one second to finish and then we'll see. Because I wanna I wanna finish it. Now, what is delta q? Because okay, so this is something new, right? What is delta q? Well delta q is easy. Remember what the definition is. Q is equal to lambda n. If I want delta q, remember what I said about lambda. Lambda is uniform, so it's the same throughout. So it's just something constant. So if I want dq, what is going to be q? It's equal to? Delta L. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys good in math? Yeah. No, yes? Yeah. So if I do that, then my DE is equal to K uh, lambda DL. Lambda DL divided by R squared R hat. And that will be my uh, DE. Now remember, I know E is uniform. Okay, I'm expecting it to be uniform. So what does that mean? That means if I take the integration of both sides, dE is equal to the integration of k d, uh, lambda dL, sorry, lambda dL divided by r squared r hat, then I can write this as E equals to, k of course comes out, and then I have a lambda sorry, comes out, r is and then dL divided by r squared r hat. And if I want EX, I take EX. If I want EY, I can take EY, and so forth. And then this goes from, in this case, let's say this is L, that goes from 0 to L. OK? So did you see how, is it really lots of calculus? No? Is it? Dr. Okay, this is to be this part where you get the. Just, just let's look at the line only. Yeah. Just look at the line only. OK? If I'm doing a line, Okay, which is now the charge, instead of a point charge, I'm looking at uniformly charged distribution. So the charge is uniformly, do you guys know what uniformly charged distribution is? Evenly. Yeah, equally distributed. Okay, that's fine, right? So I have a lambda here, a lambda here, a lambda here, a lambda here. If I sum all, so I multiply lambda by L, I get Q, the total charge. Okay? But remember what I want. I want to find the electric field at this point, due to this guy. Now, I know I can do it simply because the distance is not the same throughout, mm -hmm. right? It's not simply Q times uh, Q divided by R squared times, uh, times K. Uh, what I have to do it, 
I have to break down this line into small, it's called infinitesimal, infinitesimal charges, it's just like the point charge, right? And then substitute in there, so each one will give me a DE, 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 me a DE. then to sum them, what's integration? Integration is sum, right? What's the definition of integration? It's sum, mm -hmm. right? So then I sum the whole thing, all of these guys, so I integrate both sides, and then I get the electric field. Okay? The good thing is that it's only three, uh, uh, three cases I think we have to deal with. We have to deal with the line, we have to deal with the ring, and we have to deal with the sheet. Okay? And in fact, in, in one or two chapters, actually in one more chapter, we'll go to Gauss's law, and Gauss's law will take care of this very easily. But unfortunately, we have to do it. Yeah? Yeah, um, I have a question. When you wrote dq equals lambda dl, lambda is constant? Yeah. Oh, okay, now I yeah. Okay. yeah, lambda is constant. Okay. Lambda, that's what gives me the uniform charge distribution. Okay? All right. Any questions before? I'm going to take one example Can today. Example? Yeah, we will. We will do one example today. And then, inshallah, next class, we'll come back to this again, the introduction again, and we'll do the remaining example. But before I do that, I just want to show you these pictures. Something that uh, I thought guys. I taught this course, uh, I actually I taught a lot of times in, in the, in, during Ramadan. And it's one of the pictures somebody sent me. And, uh, shh, guys, peace. And you know in, in Ramadan, when you know, feel, uh, guys, peace. Uh, in Ramadan, when guys, you know, feel soft and, you know, uh, really in good touch with uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's something that I think in somewhere in Africa, where this is how people go to school in the open and look at the blackboard they're using. It's story and it's just one thing that you should connect with here or reflect on actually, I think, is the uh, bounties or the things that we have here at the University of Charlotte. Right? If you compare your situation to their situation, I think there is no comparison whatsoever. Now, uh, alhamdulillah, here we have air conditioning, we have a beautiful campus, we have facilities like no other, uh, top in the world, and uh, it just means that we really have to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, I'm talking about you guys, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, you get the best education. You have at least, uh, see, I'm not talking about myself, but we have decent professors, uh, we have facilities, I think, whatever you want, and some of you are even, you know, have uh, access to uh, much more uh, outside the university. If you compare yourself to these guys, I think there is no comparison whatsoever. And just this, this is one way of, uh, you know, we always have to reflect on things. And it's one thing that you should guys reflect on is that the uh, amount of, uh, you know, yeah, the loss of value is And of course, now that this goes to, you know, shows the, the campus here and the, how beautiful it is and how you just goes, sometimes we get used to it. We see it one day, two, three, four, five, one year, two years, then it becomes natural for us. Yes, no, no, it's something that others d dream of. And yet we have it here. So that's just something, a uh, reflection that uh, I did it in, as I said, in Ramadan, and then I left it in the notes and stuff. Okay, so let's come back to reality. Okay, and uh, continuous charge distribution or uniform, guys, please, uniform charge distribution. So uh, we have three of them. We have a volume charge distribution, rho, and we have a surface charge distribution, sigma and we have a line charge distribution uh, uh, lambda. So uh, let me just clean, clean up some of this so that we simply see them. So if I look at very small, uh, so lambda is defined as, as you can see there, is dq over dn. Or if you want, dq, which is the one we want, is lambda dn. For the surface charge distribution, right, which is uh, here, line, or I, I wrote that line chart. Here we have sheet. Okay, so here we have dq 
is equal to sigma, which is constant, dA. Uh, you guys, guys, dA. So both x and y uh, uh, change. So we uh, have only three cases G Yeah, that, these are the only three cases that we have to deal with. And dQ here is equal to rho dB. Okay? Now, I know that some of you did not take calculus 2. Calculus 2? You are, yeah. yeah, okay, so you're taking that. So we may not be able to do the uh, two and three dimensional uh, integrals, but definitely we will be able to do the one dimensional integral. That's where we're going to start. I, I talked about these, all of these things that I mentioned here, they're discussed here. So I want to do the first example because we have about five minutes. Okay, so uh, let me just do it over here. Now, guys. So what do we want to do, please? The, uh, what we have, we have a situation where we have a, a ring. So the charm is distributed over a ring. Okay? And I want to find the electric field. Okay? The electric field at some point P, which is located at a distance x from the origin of the ring. Okay? So that's what I want to find the electric field here. What is the electric field at this point? Uh, so again, go back to my uh, argument, the discussion that I started with. We said in such cases, we have to break down the discharge into small infinitesimal uh, charge. Yeah. In this case, it will be delta, always in fact, delta Q. But this is a ring. Right? Mm -hmm. So that means I can consider this as a lambda. Right? So that means my delta Q is equal to lambda ah, delta L. And my L in this case, L, is equal to 2 pi R. So delta L will be equal to 2 pi dr. Okay? Fine? I just want to, because I want to do it step by step. So when I go back to my definition, what's the definition for calculating the electric field for a uniformly charged distribution for you? Ah. Come on, K, D E, uh, sorry, uh, D Q divided by R squared, and then I have my R hat. That's what the definition is. Why we use just, just, just let's, let's, this is the definition that we're going to use. Okay. That's the definition for calculating, or the formula for calculating the electric field due to some uh, uniformly charged distribution. Okay? Why did I use lambda? Well, use the and but this is a line. We remember what, what is our definition of a line charge distribution? It's for lambda the yeah, it's a long line, right? Yeah. This is the ring, just like you ring here, right? Yeah. So it's if you think of it, if you break it. What does it look like? Yeah, it's a line. Except the shape is not uh, a linear line. It's a line, it's just in the form of a ring. Yeah, that's what I said. L is equal to 2 pi r. I took the circumference. Yeah, but if you want <coughs> If I want... Just to, no, but this is not uh, This is not a volume. Volume, that means the whole sphere is filled with a charge. I'll take the area. Yeah, area, then you have a sheet. That means the whole field is, is filled with a charge. Now this here in the middle is nothing. Yeah. The charge is distributed over here only. That's why I'm considering this as a line charge distribution, land. Okay? I just want to show you that even though it looks a little bit, uh, it's not really uh, that hard. Okay? Okay. Okay, so let me put things together. So E, now the other thing that you should notice, and it's over there, because of the way this, uh, this guy is, so this, this DQ here is going to give me an electric field, DE, right? And it will have an X component and a Y component, right? But wait, 
they're equal, so they cancel out. Not the equal, y can not equal. Symmetric. Symmetric. Symmetric, thank you very much. So this would give me a DE, and it would have a DE. So y, y and a DE X. The Y component. Right. So the Y component is ready. And the X component will do Because of symmetry. In an exam, all you have to do is hit the Y component. The Y component of the electric field is equal to zero because of symmetry. So in here, the only thing that I need to calculate is EX, which is equal to K, again, uh, DQ, R squared, and then EX. So I took cosine D. Right? X component is cosine theta. That's the angle. That's my angle. Theta, that's my angle theta. This is my angle theta, and that's my angle theta. Okay? All right? So let's just very quickly here. So remember this distance is x, and this distance here is, by definition, is r. And this definition, this distance here is r by definition. And from dq to the yeah. origin is a. Yeah. Okay, so let's put these things together. K, and then I have dq, r is equal to x squared plus r squared. This is r, so, uh, sorry, plus a squared. This is a. So, plus a squared. It's a square root, but it's squared. So it goes. And then I have cosine theta. This is my theta, right? Cosine would be a over this one. r is equal to x squared plus a squared, okay? So my cosine theta will be x over square root of x squared plus a squared, and then I have dq. So if I just put everything together, k dq divided by x squared plus a squared to the power of 3 halves. I forgot the next here. Do you see in this formula or in this integral anything that is that can be integrated? Yes. Yeah. X squared is x squared. Yeah, but x is constant. Does x change? No, but no. It's weird, it's weird. So x does x change? No. No. Does a change? No. 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 So in fact, all of this guy can come out. Can, uh, can come out. So I have k x over x squared plus a squared to the power of 3 halves, and I have dq. If you integrate dq from 0 to q, what do you get? q. That's it. See how easy it is? Even though it's a little bit confusing, but it's very straightforward. So, so ex is equal to kx divided by x squared plus a squared to the power of 3 halves multiplied by q. And q, I got it from the integration of dq over the full ring. Okay? That's my ex, and ey is equal to zero. In which direction is this guy in? It's along this direction. Okay, in the positive direction. So, what we'll do, we'll stop here, just before you, uh, and then we'll carry on because we have to see what happens, for example, the first question that what happens to e when you're at the center? When you're right at the center? Zero. When you're right at the center, what, is mean, what does uh, right at the center mean? X is equal to? Zero. zero. So the electric field right at the center is equal to? Zero. Can you see that here? If you're right here at the center, right? The, this guy will go down, and this guy will go up and it will cancel. So we have to make sense of that next time, inshallah. Right? So I'll stop here and we'll see you on Thursday.